my Sri Guru Vedavaha, Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapti Kamdena Bhutala, Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swal Padati Kam, Nama Om Vishnu Vadaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutala, Sri Mahti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Dinamane, Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauda Mani Gochari Nehru Shusha Sunya Vadi Pasyatya Devi Satarne, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara Srivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. The frogs, who had all along been like silent, suddenly began croaking when they heard the rumbling of the rain clouds. In the same way that Brahman students who performed their morning duties in silence begin reciting their lessons when called by their teacher. So, very, uh, what we say, instructive analogy using the example of nature, specifically the frogs. When there is some rumbling within the clouds, or the rain clouds, the frogs start making noise like that. So in the same way, when the teacher calls the students, they start to respond to the teacher's instructions. And here it mentions they respond by chanting Vedic mantras or reciting the Vedic verses. So, um, brahmachari life is called student life. Student means one who must understand the philosophical teachings that are given to him as the foundation for his execution of devotional service and his progress towards the ultimate goal of devotional service, which is to develop love for Krishna. So we are not a Gandhi movement. We are not a karmi movement, we are a bhakti movement, we are bhaktis. But jnana and karma, activities and philosophical teachings, are foundation in helping us to guide us on in the direction of pure devotional service. Otherwise, bhakti is pure. Bhakti requires no separate knowledge of itself nor does it require any kind of activities. Bhakti is the natural condition of the living entity. Nitya Siddha, Krishna Prema Sadhuka Bhunoi, Sravanadi Siddhi Chitte Kodi Udoi. So everyone has love of God, it's natural. To love God is natural, to live in this material world is unnatural. So we're in an unnatural situation, and we're trying to return to our natural situation, being a devotee of God, and serving the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord, and perfecting our life in pure devotional service, or pure Krishna consciousness. But one thing is very fundamental to that whole thing, and here it's, it's emphasized, and that is the spiritual master. And so in every, when we say, science, or every so what else? Every form of study, there is someone who is to, there to lead it and to guide the students, to guide the, you know, the followers. And therefore, one has to have a foundation in order to go in the right direction. Now, the spiritual master is one who is already there and is teaching others how to come. Where is he? He has reached transcendental consciousness, or he has. Uh, awaken his love for Krishna. Sometimes we use a little cliche. He knows the way, he goes the way, he shows the way. Like that. So he knows, he's going, and he's also teaching. And of course, his service to the Supreme Lord is to guide others. And so, generally, and especially in this age, and particularly in this age, People are lazy spiritually. Manda sumanda matayo manya bhagya bhagya. 
people are not inclined to spiritual life. They're inclined to sense gratification and economic development. And this is the tendency which is very strong in this age. And materialistic society doesn't foster any clear direction for people to perfect their life spiritually. They say if you want to be spiritual, if you want to be religious, that's fine, you do it on your own. But we're secular, we're, what we say, interested in giving you the basic and, what we say, beyond the basic activities that are, have to do with the mind, mind, body, and the intelligence. So it's all about external. So the whole society is geared in the wrong way, simply catering to the body demands of life. And so even innocent people who are born in this society who may have some inclination for higher knowledge are swept away by this uh, trend towards sense gratification and economic development. Sometimes I see kids going to school in the morning Wherever I'm staying, I look out the window and sometimes I see children being taken by the school bus or by their parents. And I think, oh, another person is going to be slaughtered. But Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, modern education is a slaughterhouse. It simply destroys all the good qualities of the living entity and gives them just a foundation for memorizing certain things that they're supposed to regurgitate back later and then get some position in society and become a good consumer. So the whole educational system is to produce more and more consumers. That's why the banks are always lending money to people because they want money, you to borrow money and buy, buy, Therefore, you have to work, or work, work to pay back your debts. So it's all a plot to pro proliferate the whole capitalistic society by just engaging people in bodily activities. So this age is not so good. It's a bad age. Sometimes we wonder why the movies can't stay steady in Krishna consciousness. It's a lot of times because of the conditioning that they have been brought up and by the features of the age. But when you have a powerful acharya, a strong spiritual teacher, who comes by the grace of the Lord, or is empowered by the Lord, then there is a chance to overcome the tendency for materialistic life. So I just mentioned here, and is required, and when the students, or those who have some inclination to a spiritual life, take shelter of such a personality, then they can understand what is actually the real goal of life and how to become happy. Because both of them are synonymous. The goal of life and becoming happy are synonymous. Therefore, you could use the same principle and say that because materialistic society is away from the goal of life, nobody's happy. <laughs> you can't have happiness when you're in the wrong direction or you're focusing on the wrong thing. The wrong thing is I am this body and to gratify the senses to the end of life is the goal of life. Eat, big, eat drink and be merry and die. That's, that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. right? In different forms. It's a simplified way to, to speak about what is a very complex way of doing the same thing. That's all it is. So this is, this is materialistic life. So, but when we have a personality who is empowered by the Lord, who represents the Lord, he's called, not he's called, he's not called a guru here, or a spiritual master, the word acharya is used. And acharya has a certain definition that is different than a spiritual master and a guru. It means one who teaches by example. There are persons who may put themselves in a position of spiritual leaders, but they don't follow the program for making spiritual progress. They teach, but they don't, what we say, follow exactly. They think I'm above the teachings that I'm giving, and therefore I don't have to follow them. I teach, everyone else follows, 
And because I'm self-realized, I'm a guru, God appeared in my dream and told me I'm the next incarnation. Right? You hear these things all the time. It's going on more and more in the West, but in India, it's, it's, a, it's a common thing. And so people get cheated. <clears throat> and even those who have tendencies for spiritual life, sometimes they find themselves under the influence of someone who is not qualified or is teaching them in the wrong direction. And you find that as there is a lot of them now, by mantras, become powerful by chanting mantras. Free yourself from suffering and enjoy your inner peace. I mean, that's not so bad, but it's not the goal either. And then there's those who probably proliferate that you can do any damn thing you want in the name of spirituality, you just have to chant these mantras. It's very common now. You get, if you look at these yoga societies, they, they teach people certain physical gymnastics. They're always giving them some kind of ways of doing yoga. And there's various types of yoga, they're all cheating. Have you seen the, variety, the varieties of yoga that are out there now? Sex yoga, beer yoga, people drink beer and do yoga. I don't know if you've seen that. And then there's laughing yoga. You sit there and that makes you laugh and laugh and laugh. And then that, 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 because you're laughing, you achieve some happiness. It's all quite ludicrous when you look at it. So what goes on in the name of spirituality, yoga, and various types of practices, or even the philosophy that accompanies this, is all coming from people's ideas. And they may take a little bit out of the Vedas, and take a little bit here, and they take a little bit there, and they come up with something new. But the Acharyas, and especially his divine grace, you know, Prabhupada says, spirituality is nothing new. The, the way it may be executed may be adjusted according to time, place, and circumstance and according to the consciousness of the candidate. But the, the process is as old as Krishna is, <laughs> because Krishna is the source of that process. So there is nothing new about spiritual life. Therefore, when people come up with these new ideas, I think, well, because people like that, they somehow look for something different, something new, and they think, oh, this must be something better than I tried before. Right? And be especially Americans, they're very much inclined to try different things. But they're also very skeptical because they've been burned so many times like that. So our movement's not new, it's just old, as Krishna has said and has explained. Tene Brahma Hida Abhikabhaye. This knowledge was given to Lord Brahma in the heart by Lord Krishna himself directly. It's, it's there from the beginning of time. Well, it's nothing new. So well, when a person comes and starts to try to teach something different, something new, automatically those who have a little bit of experience and maybe some intelligences can be a little wary of such things. But everyone must have a goal, and so spiritual life must have a goal. What is that goal? Prema Pumartha Maha. If that's not the goal of spiritual life, then, then whatever other goal is replaced or put in that place simply leads one in the wrong direction. What is Prema Pumartha Maha? It means to develop our love for Krishna. That's, all. that's, the, that's the only goal of spiritual life. We have intermediate goals, how to get there, by studying the Vedas, by chanting mantras, by worshiping the Lord, and by performing many activities. But these all lead towards the goal. If they don't, then as the scriptures say, Shrama Eva Hikevo, they're a useless waste of time. So what does that mean? That means that whatever we do should help us awaken our natural attraction for Krishna. An attraction for Krishna is awakened when we perform our activities with a desire to please the Lord. Because when the Lord is pleased, automatically one gets two things, or actually three. 
When the Lord is pleased, we get detachment from material activities. We get a sense of happiness from that activity. And we also get a, a, more of a realization of our, our relationship with the Supreme Lord. All these come by pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that is the actual foundation. So here, the spiritual master comes to teach us what is the way to please the Lord? Or what are the activities that lead to pleasing the Lord? Every day we sing Sri Guru Charana Padma Kevala Bhakati Sarma Bandam Muni Sarvadana Mate. This song, written by Shiva Narakam Das Thakur, is one of the most philosophically sound uh, presentations in glorification of the spiritual master and his activities. Uh, Narakam Das Thakur's writings are actually the Siddhanta, or the conclusion of the Vedas. Uh, he not only composes poetry and songs and various other expressions of devotion, but they all lead to the goal of the pure devotional service. So, Guru Mukha Padma Bhakya, no, no, wait, wait, let's go back. Sri Guru Charana Padma Kevala Bhakati Sadma. Uh, the lotus feet of the spiritual master are the embodiment of pure devotional service. Everything is found at the lotus feet. Lotus feet is synonymous with service. So when we say lotus feet, one approaches the Lord, one approaches the spiritual master through the feet. In other words, with a submissive attitude in order to learn and in order to be guided, guided also. So those lotus feet contain everything that is needed. And bando mogi mate. I bow down to those lotus feet. Not just bow down, but I bow down with great order efforts. That's what the actual translation is. Priya Prabhupada says in a very what we say, instructing way, he says, not hatchet. So you know what a hatchet is. It's an axe. So when you cut wood, you go, choo -choo, choo -choo, go down and come up. He says, not like that. That's not obeisances. Obeisances means to put your head to the floor and very devotionally recite the prayers to the spiritual master. And offering those prayers as you offer, as you recite those prayers. That is obeisances. It's not simply some execution of some function that we have to do because it's part of the instructions. It's much more than that. And that's why Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Manmana Baba Man Bhakta, Mamyaji Man Namaskuru, Mami Vaishyasi Satyam Te Pratijan Opriyamsimi. He says, always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, and offer your homage to me. So, it's explained that these four principles are the foundation of all spiritual activities. All spiritual activities are included in these four principles. So the last one is offering obeisances. So offering obeisances to the Lord, to the devotees, to the spiritual master, is such an important part of devotional service. And it must be done in the right mood. Otherwise, it's just some ritual. What's a ritual? When people don't know why they're doing it. Then the activity becomes a ritual. When you know why you're doing it, you know who you're doing it for, and you do it in the mood that it's meant to be done, that is bhakti. That is bhakti. Otherwise, it falls short of the actual goal. So, what is the next line? Yanhara prasadivai e bhavatariyai krishna prapti koi yanhara The spiritual master has the power to carry you across the ocean of material existence. So material existence is rightly compared to an ocean. No one can cross the ocean by themselves. Even if you're the best of all swimmers, it is impossible to cross the ocean. Even if sometimes if you have a boat, you can't make it across.
waters unless you have an ocean water. So therefore, the spiritual master provides the boat of pure devotional service. He is the captain of the ship, the favorable winds, or the execution of devotional service. And he can take you, where does he take you? Krishna Prabhupada Hoi and Hoite. He takes you to the lotus feet of the Lord, which is the goal of Krishna consciousness, to become fixed in service to the Supreme Personality of God. So that's his mission. Guru Mukha Padva Vakya, Chite Te Kuriya Vakya, Ana Kuriya As. Stay in class, there's nothing else to do. Don't worry about breakfast. Um, yeah, so Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chite Te Kuriya Akya. This is a very important statement. What does it mean? That the words of my spiritual master are actually my food, my substances, my life, my nourishment. Everything that I need is in those words. Therefore, I'm fixed on that. Prabhupada says, whatever Krishna says, that's all we care. <laughs> he's, he's using a very, what we say, you know, a sweeping statement. People say this, people say that, we don't care. Whatever Krishna says, that's what we say. In other words, we're going right to the source and getting the, the heart of the information. So that heart of that information is carried by the spiritual master. So whatever the spiritual master, he does two things in terms of what he says. He gives spiritual guidance and he gives philosophical and spiritual knowledge. So both are required. If you just get knowledge without guidance, you might find yourself in the wrong direction or somehow or other not able to stay on, stay on the path. If you could just get guidance, that is even, that's better. But then again, you find yourself in a situation where you have to use spiritual knowledge to overcome or to move forward in spiritual life, just like when Maya attacks. And Maya will attack. And then if you have the right knowledge, you can see Maya coming and you also know how to understand the nature of Maya's attack and how to take shelter of the Lord in those situations. So the spiritual master provides these two aspects of the of devotional service, philosophical and spiritual knowledge and uh, practical guidance on how to execute devotional service. And that may be different from person to person. Uh, I'm attached to the words of my spiritual master. I'm attached to him. I don't need anything else. <laughs> That's all I need. Then there's no need to go anywhere else. So the explanation of that statement is, I don't need to go anywhere else. Everything I need is found there in the words of my spiritual master, in the service to my spiritual master. It becomes the foundation for everything I do and everything I want in spiritual life. And this is the meaning of that. Chaksi Dudan Dilo Ye, Janmi Janmi Prabhu. Sometimes Prabhu would say Janmi Janmi Pita Say. And Prabhu means master and Pita means father. So sometimes the spiritual master is looked at and seen and rightly so as one's father. The Vedas are the mother, the spiritual master is the father, and he leads us to the Supreme Father, Sri Krishna himself, like that. So that word is used. So I was born in the dark and of ignorance. In other words, I came into this world, I had no knowledge of who I am and what the purpose of life is. And then I went to school and started to grow up and I found so many other way, ideas of what life is about and how to live life. But now, I've been sleeping. Why am I sleeping? Because I don't know what's good for me. Now I've come to, this, come to waking up. 
and spiritual mastery problems that he forces open your eyes, just like in the morning sometimes when that alarm clock rings, you look for the snooze button, right? But this, this spiritual master has no snooze button on there. You can't turn it off. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> so, yeah, you can't go back to sleep. He forces you. And that's his mercy. If someone is giving you something you really need, in life and is the best thing for you, but you can't really understand it, or you can't understand it fully. Sometimes force is needed to help you, and that force is actually not only mercy, it's called special mercy. Special mercy. When love or concern comes, even without asking for it, when it's needed the most. Adibya Gyan Rinde Prakasita. This word, this line is so important. Dibya means transcendental and Gyan means knowledge. So he's giving us transcendental knowledge. So what is that transcendental knowledge? He's telling you one thing, which is the sum total of Krishna. That whole, whole transcendental knowledge. You are Krishna's servant eternally. That is the knowledge. When you have that understanding, whatever body you may have, whatever activities you may have, whatever relationships you have in this world are superfluous to who you actually are. You are Krishna's eternal servant and that's all you can ever be. You cannot be anything else. And so he gives you that knowledge. You are Krishna's servant eternal. And what's the next one? Prema hmm? Bhakti Yoho Hoite Abhiyanvinase. He can give you love of God. If he wants, immediately you can start to feel love of God. He has that power. But he doesn't give it so easy. You have to work for it. <laughs> and Abhiyanvinase Yoite. He destroys the, the obstacles that come in the way of our spiritual practice. One devotee asked Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I have so many obstacles, I'm finding it difficult to do my devotions. Prabhupada, you just come to me, I can kick out all obstacles. With one kick, they're all gone. And that's the power of the spiritual master, that he can remove those obstacles by his words and by his prayers. If he prays to Krishna, please help this devotee. That devotee can make life and spiritual life becomes easier. Like that. What's the next line? Vedi Gahiyana Ramsarita. That means throughout all the Vedas, the Vedas glorify the Supreme Personality. But still, they always glorify that person who represents the Supreme Personality of Godhead as much, or maybe as more than, than the Supreme Lord, and that is the pure devotee spiritual master. So his glories are sung throughout the Vedic literatures. So spiritual master is the ticket back to Godhead. One, one of our leading devotees in the movement said to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, I don't know anything about Krishna, but I'm really attracted and attached to you. Prabhupada said, that is very nice. That is very nice. So one who makes their focus, everything around the spiritual master becomes automatically successful in the execution of devotional service. Prabhupada used to say, the spiritual master is wrong, but he's right. Figure that one out. <laughs> From my perspective, he may seem to be wrong. It may, in my logic and my reasoning and my observation tells me there's something wrong. But no, that's my limited understanding. There's more to it than what I can actually understand, what I can say. And many times, 
And sometimes it happens quite often when people can't understand either the instructions or the ways the spiritual master presents those. But there's a reason behind that. And one has to understand that it's always for the good. So therefore, tadviri patipate nam paribasyena sevaya upadeksyanti tetya jnanas tatvadarsana this verse gives you the whole principle of what is the disciple's relationship with the spiritual master. Pranipatena, pariprasyena, and sevaya. These are the three words. Pranipat means to fall down flat, humble. If one is not humble before the spiritual master, and there's five ways you can somehow mess up that relationship. When you try to impress the spiritual master by how advanced you are in devotional service, either by your service or by something you think. In other words, you're trying to show him that you're, you know, you're advanced. In other words, there's some duplicity there. Or you have another motivation for execution devotional service. I know devotional service can also help me become successful in material activities. Therefore, I'll gain that knowledge and become materially successful. Or, if I don't have faith in the spiritual master, that's another way. And another way is if I become too familiar with the spiritual master, then I take his instructions lightly. So that's another way of becoming overly familiar. Therefore, sometimes the spiritual master will be very casual and very much friendly with the disciple, but the disciple shouldn't take that in the same way. If they do, they may commit an offense or start speaking very ordinary or very, what we say, on the same level. And what happens then, one starts to minimize the importance of that relationship like that. Because when your friends mean equal, so if you start making your friendship with the spiritual master, he is the best friend because he's representing your ultimate friend who is Krishna. Therefore it says, Suhidam Sarvadehiyam. Suhidam means Krishna. He's the friend of all other entities and the spiritual master is giving you your ultimate friend, Sri Krishna. But if we take his friendly dealings as something less than um, instructions or guidance, then we may also fall into that mood of becoming ordinary in our relationship with the spiritual master. And as soon as that happens, then um, we start picking and choosing what he says. So, yeah, so this, um, that's why the Vedas not only glorify the spiritual master, but they also help us understand what is the relationship with the so paripatena means, say pariprasyena means to inquire. One should inquire regularly about one's progress in spiritual life. So Rupa Goswami mentions that. Uh, regularly one should ask the spiritual master, how can I make advancement? Or what can I do to serve? And if the spiritual master says, go on with what you're doing, that's fine. But it's always nice to check in. <laughs> it's always nice to check in and see where you, because a lot of times the spiritual master won't say anything. But it's your duty to sometimes question. And of course, if you're reading and studying, which you should be, then you come across statements you may not have a clear understanding of, or you may not have know how to apply it in your day-to-day -day life. Therefore, asking questions to the spiritual master in terms of the philosophy, and especially about Krishna. How much do we know about Krishna? What the spiritual master can tell us, or at least give us some explanation of how we should understand Krishna's activities and how Krishna performs his activities. So that knowledge is also available. And the more we know about Krishna, the more we start to become attracted to Krishna. And the more we become attracted to Krishna, the more we become attached to Krishna. And the more you become attached to Krishna, the more your life is successful, <laughs> spiritually. So, pranipat, pariprasyena, and then the last thing is sevaya. And one should 
always perform service or ask for service or look for a chance to do service like that. Prabhupada taught us, he said, a devotee should always be thinking every moment of the day, how can I serve? And if nothing comes, what do you do? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. In, in plain simple language, we're either doing something or we're chanting, reading, like that. No time for idleness. Idleness means here comes Maya. She's just waiting for you to find a gap. And your mind is not fixed in doing something. And she just enters the mind with some kind of thoughts that are useless, or some kinds of ideas that are just away from Krishna consciousness. So learning how, and this takes practice, it doesn't come automatically, to keep the mind always in the mood of devotional activities like that. And if we're not doing anything directly, we can always chant, we can always sometimes pick up a book and just start reading. So there's no gap. And Prabhupada quotes one verse, I can't remember the exact sense of it, but he says, Krishna is here and Maya is everywhere else. <laughs> so if you look straight forward, there's Krishna. If you look a little bit to the left, there's Maya. A little bit to the right, there's Maya. Under, over, behind. So keeping that vision focused on Krishna means that you're always in the best position to be in Krishna conscious. And as soon as you forget Krishna, anything could happen. Anything could happen. And that means sometimes we fall out and find ourselves in you know, a very awkward position, something goes wrong, because we weren't remembering Krishna. When you're remembering Krishna, nothing can go wrong. That's an absolute principle. As soon as you forget Krishna, watch out. <laughs> so, therefore, remembering Krishna means serving Krishna or doing something in relationship to devotional service. So, the last four lines is that he's the best friend, he's an ocean of mercy. And then Narutam then that's my courses. Lokanath, Lokanath Jiva. He's glorified his spiritual master, Lokanath Daskaraswami. So sometimes we say, Prabhupada Lokanath Jiva. That he is my life. He becomes my Haha Prabhupada Doya Deva That means you're merciful, but still I'm begging for your mercy. That's what that line means. I know you're merciful. But I have to show that I want your mercy by asking for that mercy. Because if I don't ask for it, and I don't beg for it, if I'm not eager to get it, I can think, well, it's just there. It's, and you can become a little routine. But when you ask for it, it flows. It becomes more available. So that's what that line means. And that's one of the most powerful lines in that whole prayer, is that we, we should be you're merciful, that I know, but still, I'm asking for that mercy. I want that mercy. In other words, we're begging for what we need in Krishna consciousness. And the last thing is, what is that? What is the first part? A-B, Yasa, Tribu. A-B, Yasa, Tribu. It says, Narutam Das Thakura, and this is a very beautiful prayer by saying, and your fame is not only with us, but in, not only in this world, but all over the three worlds. So a pure devotee spiritual master becomes glorified all over the three worlds, because such a person is very rare, and such a person is one that gives you, ultimately, success in life. So, if we are attached to the instructions of Yasya Devi Parabhakti, Yata Devi Tata Guru, Tas Yaita Kartita Yata Prakasanati Mahama. If you are attached to the instructions of the spiritual master, 
then you know everything in Krishna consciousness. That's what it says. All the imports of all the knowledge that are there in the Vedas become, in other words, the essence of Vedic knowledge becomes revealed to a person who makes the, the instructions of the spiritual master in their life and so on. So this is not an easy thing. It's something we have to keep working on keep hearing from the spiritual master, keep reading his books, keep, um, keep connected with the process of emotional service. That's why, um, the one point I was gonna make. Yeah, yeah, and especially, we may have our own spiritual masters, but we should understand that Every spiritual master is represented Shri Prabhupada. They are not separate or independent from Shri Prabhupada. They are all, if they're not helping you to come in contact with Prabhupada, then they're not actually doing their service completely or perfectly. So the spiritual master is connecting us to Prabhupada through Prabhupada's instructions in the form of his lectures and his books. So if we're reading Prabhupada's books, hearing his lectures, then we're getting the full package of Krishna consciousness. Because Prabhupada gave everything in his lectures and his books. So therefore Prabhupada is the foundational acharya for each and every devotee of this movement. He is the founder of acharya. It's a kind of a it's a it's a word, it's a term that has two opposite languages. Founder is English and Acharya is Sanskrit. But it fits. He is the Acharya who establishes the, uh, the principles of pure devotional service in a way that was, is revealing according to time, place, and circumstance. Although Prabhupada uh, somehow or other had to leave the Gaudiya Math in order to become successful, he never left his spiritual master. Therefore, he took the instructions of his spiritual master and applied it to teaching and preaching in the Western world. So he was innovative there, where that's why he's called founder of Charya, innovative in presenting Krishna consciousness to the Western world, which was hardly ever done before, although persons, other persons had tried, got a little ways, but never really developed it beyond a certain point. Prabhupada was successful in doing it. So therefore he's the founder of Charya, and he is not only um, connected to each and one of us, he's directly available to each and one. And we can pray to Prabhupada, we can listen to Prabhupada's lectures, and everything becomes easy and clear when we have an understanding of what Prabhupada has given us. Then we know the science of bhakti. And our spiritual master usually takes what Prabhupada has given us and presents it in his own words according to time, place, and circumstance. And if you say two and two is four, if you say three and one is four, what's the difference? There's no difference. So, but three and two, four, three and one is not five or, or two. So make sure it comes out the same way. The point is that our spiritual master is teaching based on what Prabhupada has given us. He's not changing anything. He's simply presenting it according to his own levels of realization. That's the point. Okay, so I can't see the clock, but I know. What time is it? 8.35. 8.35. Okay, any questions or comments? Yes. Um, Jai Balade. Oh, oh, Subal. Okay. Subal Prabhu.
That's not a good question. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and you mentioned Shira Prabhupada saying this and that the spiritual master, although he, he, he is rough, he's always right. Something like that. And um, you explained very nicely that actually I was, I was very, very touched by your explanation of uh, how important this principle is and how. We may think, oh, from my perspective, this is not right, but the spiritual master is always right. So, and you see that that happens. You see it around some, you know, on the borders. You experience it yourself, maybe at some times. And there is no doubt that that sort of take a hit in your faith. And, and how do you deal with that? I mean, you You can ask, if you can ask the question for clarification, that becomes the most direct and easiest way to understand everything. And in some cases you don't have the opportunity for whatever reason, then you basically just have to accept. Even if the spiritual master is wrong, Krishna will protect you because the highest principle is to follow the instructions of the spiritual master. Unless he goes against, you know, the principles. He says you don't have to follow the four eight principles or don't have to chant 16 rounds or don't have to eat prasada. If he goes against the fundamental principles that make up our activities, then that becomes obvious. But if it's a question of the personal instructions in the execution of our devotional service, we may not understand the instruction, or maybe we may not understand why that instruction was given. Or he might say something philosophically you don't understand. So then for, for those things you can inquire, basically. And if you can't inquire for him directly, you can inquire from another senior devotee for clarification. So Prabhupada said this movement is for those who are intelligent. So intelligence is, works in two ways. Try to figure it out. If you can't use it, figure it out. Use your intelligence to find out. <laughs> intelligence doesn't mean, well, I can't figure it out, therefore that's all. No, use your intelligence to, to get the answer somehow. That's another part of using intelligence. So there's always a recourse in bhakti. It's never like we're up against the wall and everything is you know, hazy and foggy. If we really want the answer, or we really want a clarification on something, we just have to do a little work sometimes to find out. But it's there. When the spiritual master speaks, sometimes he speaks just on points, and points need to be unraveled. And that's why questions are there, to help unravel the points. Mm -hmm. Just like, I don't know, what would be an example? Well, just like, you know, I, I think of this example, women are less intelligent. But when a woman becomes Krishna conscious, that doesn't apply anymore. So because we transcend the body limitations when we engage in devotional service and become Krishna conscious. So someone might use to just make the first statement without giving a clarification of that point in reality or practice. Or, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, uh, to renunciation of activities and work and devotion 
are both the same. But then again, the next verse says, but of the two, work and devotion is superior. So if you just quote that one verse without giving a follow-up explanation, renunciation of material activities and work and devotion are the same. But of the two, so people are sometimes are either not able or not don't know and just say, or the spiritual master might just give the point, and it's up to you to unravel it, to understand it, to question it. But it's not that you do that on everything. <laughs> if you do it on everything, that means you haven't learned how to execute devotional service. You have to use your intelligence. Like on practical matters. One time, Prabhupada gave me instructions about getting some information on farming. So Prabhupada, the devotee asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, why don't you ask someone who's expert in that area? Why are you asking me? Or sometimes people come up to me, they're grihastas, they're having trouble in their grihasta life. So I might also give them some advice. But if they go to a senior grihasta couple, who have experience in rehearsal life, they can probably learn more than just hearing from someone who was given philosophical and, and theoretical knowledge as opposed to somebody who has experienced and somehow or other has passed through these experiences. So yeah, like that. So we use our intelligence. Intelligence is the factor that connects the soul with, with God. The mind, when it's connected with the intelligence, is connected. When the mind is not connected with the intelligence, it usually goes off in a different direction. So what is the intelligence? What is the feature of intelligence? Determination and discrimination. To become determined, in whatever you do and to discriminate between what is beneficial and what is not. Mm -hmm. Like that. But all these are tools you can work with. But there's always an answer. There's always the correct answer. And I listen to Prabhupada every day and sometimes Prabhupada Devotees are saying things that Prabhupada said before in reference to what Prabhupada is saying now, and Prabhupada rejects that. They're applying what he said before to what he's saying now, and Prabhupada dismisses it. Because what he's saying now, he has a different angle of vision on it. So what he said before applies to what he was saying at that time, to that circumstance. And what he's saying now, is where you inquire and try to understand. So that's why if you read Prabhupada's books and if you listen to his lectures, a lot of times you find some contradictions, apparent contradictions. But therefore inquiry is necessary for further clarification. But if it's clear, then you can just go on. Does that help? Yeah. Any other Jai Baladev? Yeah. So, and so we see that sometimes, um, like Adishik Maharaj, 
The thing is, if you can't commit, keep committing the same mistake, then that is a problem. But, therefore, a little transgression in the execution of bhakti doesn't make one any less qualified to execute bhakti in a, in a, in a, in a successful way. That's for that verses. Bhakti Vinod Thakur astounded everyone with the real revelation of the meaning of that verse by saying, that verse means those who see that person as saintly, they are also saintly. That's what it means. So, yeah, we like, we like to pick out a little flaw and make that the person's character description. But the worst thing you can do is that if you make a mistake of you fall down and you go away from the emotional service, you go away from the bodies, that's the greatest mistake. That's criticizable. And then, but the thing is, you slip, you get back up. You're considered to be still able to get the full mercy of the Lord. And you have the example. We have our example. Was it about making money? It was a murderer. He couldn't even chant the name of Ram when he was asked to chant the name of Ram. He was, you know, Mara wanted to tell him, you know, all right, give up all your activities, now chant the name of Ram. He couldn't do it. It was so simple. Ram's name couldn't come out of his tongue. So Mara Muni thought some way to do it. He told him to chant Mara. M-A-R-A. Mara, 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 So he was chanting Mara long enough and attended to Ram. The same letters, just reverse order. So yeah, we have Valmiki Muni. Where else? There's other examples also. Oh, you have Agrari the Hunter. He was killing an animal's half. And Parvamuni saw him after he was 
blessed by Narada Muni. He couldn't believe the same person. He wouldn't even step on an ad with the speaker, you know, doing anything else. So yeah, if you only see what a person's past is, or even if they make a mistake in the present, you're holding on to their shadow. It's not them. You're holding on to their shadow. The worst, thing, the worst thing they can do is go away or become less enthusiastic. Then, then they made a mistake. Fall down, you get back up. Prabhupada says, third class to fall down, it's first class to get up. But the thing is, sometimes when you fall down, your pride is hurt. And it's hard to get back up because that pride won't let you. Oh, I'm so, I was such a great devotee, now I'm... So let me go away. That's even that will solve the problem. And sometimes people think like that. A lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other? Yes. It says a devotee should do things according to the instructions of the spiritual master and the words of the scriptures. That's called Shastra of Chakshus, seeing through the eyes of knowledge, not seeing through my mind. Mental speculation is what it is. It's just speculation. This philosophical speculation what helps to lead to some, you know, what we say, devotional conclusion, but not mental If you have to think of how to do something, that's not mental speculation. But mental speculation is, is it like this, is it like that, is it like this, I see it like this, she sees it like that, everybody sees it differently. That's mental speculation. Today I like it, tomorrow I don't like it. <laughs> okay? He did do mistakes because he took the wrong side. That's why he made mistakes. He was on the wrong side. He was against Krishna. That was this mistake that led to other mistakes. He was a Brahmin. He took up the role of a Kshatriya and he was under the, under the tutelage of uh, Dhyana. So he took a bad master. Therefore, he makes some mistakes. So if you go, if you go in the wrong direction, you obviously going to do the wrong thing. If you start off with three and one is five, and then you do all your equations after that. Based on that, everything else is wrong. The foundation is not there. So what is the foundation? The Krishna is the source of everything, and I am Krishna's. Eternal servant. That's the foundation for everything you do. Everything is owned by Krishna. Everything is controlled by Krishna. I am Krishna's servant. If you have that, you have the foundation. But if you think outside of that, then it's different. Then you're going to get something different. Okay, anything else? 
Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Ferrari, you have any time? You have some time?